Okay, I guess it's time. Um, welcome to um, August Indoor Ag Science Cafe. I'm Cherry Kubora sitting in Ohio State. Um, I hope you like my background, new background. You know, it's, it's a new system I just purchased. It's a green wall, but I can select greenhouse view, or I can select indoor ag view, and then of course, I select the indoor ag view um, for this um, cafe. So anyway, so um, I just wanted to start a few things, um, slides. Um, this one is a monthly forum. Um, organized by uh, three members, myself, Carrie Mitchell, and Eric Ranko. Uh, Carrie is from Purdue, and Eric is from uh, Michigan State. Eric cannot make it because he is in China this week. So anyway, so just showing you the function, um, uh, lower left corner is the mute icon, which is the very important. I, even though we have many people log in, I really like to use microphone system rather than chat area, although I don't ignore the chat, or I try not to ignore the chat, but um, the microphone is much easier for me to manage. So you are encouraged to use microphone, but if you are not using, then please mute using this icon. And then also you're welcome to use video to, um, um, uh, show your face, um, uh, introduce you, um, whatever. So that's that's good. So um, July, as you remember, we didn't have any cafe. And uh, August, um, um, Nadia Saba, um, Dr. Greenhouse, is going to give a talk. And then as usual, we have about 30 minutes-ish uh, presentation, which is recorded. And then the rest of the time we are not recording because we wanted to have a free discussion so that you can you can you know you can feel comfortable to um, to uh, talk about your things. And then the next month, September twenty fourth, which I believe Tuesday, eleven a.m. Um, cafe is gonna be international. We are gonna have Dutch um, company Southon. Um, two engineers or two persons from there, um, Justin and Andrea, going to give us um, uh, a talk introducing what they do. Um, and then we have still um, opening, uh, actually we are working on scheduling October, November, December, and then we will let you know what's there. Um, so I guess with that, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Dr. Saba from, uh, Dr. Greenhouse, who is um, the expert of HVAC system design optimization for controlled environment agriculture facility, PhD from the University of Arizona. And so I'd like to have her. So I, I'm going to stop sharing here. And then you can share your screen, Nadia. OK. And you can hear me still? Yes. Awesome. All right. Okay, here we go. Slideshow mode. There we go. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, uh, Cherry, for inviting me to present at this Indoor Ag Science Cafe. Um, just so all of you know, Cherry gave me a 30 minute limit to talk, which it's always good to give Nadia a limit to talk about this subject because I can talk for hours about it. Um, so I, I, I've really tried to narrow down um, the, the, the key items that I want to talk about and to present to you today uh, and, and have sort of some assumptions about the audience that I have here uh, being a little bit more knowledgeable about plant, indoor plant environment. So we'll skip over some of the, the normal stuff that I might present to engineers or newbies in the industry. So I am the president of Dr. Greenhouse and we are mechanical and agricultural engineers that specialize in the design of HVAC systems for indoor farms and greenhouses. I started uh, this slideshow with a picture of cannabis facilities. I have no idea if anyone on this call uh, works in or with cannabis, uh, but uh, I just figured this would be a good place uh, to, I don't know, start to feel the room. All right. so. I know I'm preaching to the choir here with a couple of these first slides, but you know, ultimately, why why do we want to grow 
indoors, right? So we want to be able to grow anywhere, anytime, anything, basically. Uh, have consistent product quality, high crop densities and yields. We can reduce the footprint of the land that we grow a given amount of product on. It allows us to help manage pests by excluding them, uh, even whether that's deer tromping through our spinach fields or whether that's you know white flies that are uh, nibbling at, at our leaves. Uh, we can potentially use less water, reduce our waste and, and our waste streams, and, and also help to promote consumer safety or facilitate consumer safety. And, and in the end, we all want to maximize profitability and minimize risks, right? And so it all really comes down to control. That's why we call this controlled environment agriculture, because we're controlling and have the ability to control so many of the variables and inputs that go into our indoor plant environment, including climate, irrigation, lighting, pests, right, and quality. That's what it all comes down to. So what is HVAC? HVAC is an acronym for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Sometimes there's an R stuck at the end for refrigeration. And basically for an indoor plant environment, we are responsible for controlling the environment around the top of the plant, right? The atmosphere, the aerial environment, the shoot environment, whatever you wanna call it, we are controlling the air. And so that is really broken down into two pieces. One is climate. So the things we think about, temperature and humidity or vapor pressure deficit, as well as moving air across the plants. And then there's air quality. So what are the constituents in the air? What are the things in the air that we wanna control? Well, carbon dioxide, right, to help our plants grow. We also wanna control pollutants and pests to help our plants grow. So molds, insects, ethylene, carbon monoxide. If you're in cannabis, you're also probably trying to control VOCs and odors. Um, and, and all of this is within the scope of HVAC. So as, as a grower, what are your or their primary concerns? Temperature control, humidity control, air distribution, air cleanliness, CO2 enrichment, flexibility and nimbleness of the equipment, cost, and oh, did I mention humidity control? It's a big one, right? Because everyone is struggling with that one. So I'm just gonna quickly go over some of the things that you might already know in terms of plant responses to their environment. So we know that temperature is closely linked to the rate of photosynthesis. Right, so um, this is a chart for, for tomatoes, and we see that up to about 23, 25 degrees Celsius, we can actually increase the rate of photosynthesis and therefore increase the rate of growth. We also see that transpiration rates for the same humidity level increase with an increasing temperature. And, and you know, speaking of evapotranspiration, this is one of the big things that we are trying to control with temperature and humidity. This is the evaporation of water from leaves through their stomata, right, through their stomates. Um, and, and it's really responsible for delivering water and nutrients from the roots, up from the roots, through the shoot, into the leaf, and out of the plant, right? And, and those nutrients and, and water get delivered to all the different plant parts, right, the, the leaves, the fruits, the flowers, and if we shut down evapotranspiration, then we have we can have a lot of um, biotic or abiotic stresses as well as biotic stresses. So, you know, most people think in terms of humidity, relative humidity, and the problem with relative humidity is that you can have the same exact water content in the air, but as you change the temperature, the relative humidity changes with it. So you see, as we increase the temperature for a given amount of water, we decrease the relative humidity, but the cup is still full to the same level, okay? Uh, we still have the same amount of water. We've just changed the size of the cup. That's how I should say it. So a, high, a larger, a higher temperature basically means a larger cup, but you still have the same volume of water in it. So it, it's not really the best way to 
think about moisture content of the air as it relates to plants. A better way to think about it, and this is a hot topic right now, most people are starting to talk about vapor pressure, pressure deficit, and I'm so happy to hear more people talk about it, but it's that difference between the water content of the air at a given temperature and humidity, and the water content of the air at the same temperature but at saturation. And usually we, we like to look at the plant temperature, but if you don't know what the plant leaf temperature is, we can use the air temperature as a proxy to figure out the saturation uh, content. And it's this differential right here that is what drives moisture out of the plant. It's what drives evapotranspiration. So, so why is VPD important? And this chart is for tomatoes. There's other charts and data available for many different types of leafy green plants. Um, we see that, in, in, at least in this recent study, that reducing the VPD down from, say, 1.8 to 1.2 for tomatoes uh, increased the growth rate and the net assimilation rate of CO2 in the plant. It also increased fruit yield by almost 25%, just by decreasing the VPD and keeping all other variables constant. That is, that's huge, right, for your bottom line, for increasing your profitability. Um, you know, so VPD, it, it's kind of hard, right, to understand. This is a psychrometric chart. If you're not an engineer, this probably looks very crazy and very confusing. Um, we've whittled it down on our website. Um, to give to create a table or a chart where you can punch in whatever the temperature is and the relative humidity is of your space or what you're targeting, and it will calculate a vapor pressure deficit. And then you can click on these different buttons for the different crops you have to kind of see what zone you should be in for the temperature uh, that you're targeting. So CO2, look, we know that CO2 uh, that, that plants need CO2 for photosynthesis, so if we have more CO2, then we're going to have greater rates of photosynthesis and greater rates of growth. What most people don't always understand, however, is that it's very related to what the temperature and the light levels are inside the space. So I see a lot of growers that are growing at a very low temperature and pumping their rooms with, say, 1,500 parts per million of CO2. Well, you're just wasting energy because your plants can't use that much CO2 at the low temperatures that you're growing them at. Same with light intensities. Air movement. Okay, so especially if you are growing in a vertical farm in multiple levels, in multiple layers, getting air movement through your crop canopy is essential for all sorts of reasons. One, it's going to be responsible for delivering that CO2 to your leaf. It also removes waste from your plant, right, from your leaf. It removes that water vapor um, from evapotranspiration. It removes heat from the lights that are being, you know, that are directly overhead uh, the, the plants. So, so having air to move CO2 toward the plant and air movement to remove heat and moisture away from the plant is essential. And it helps to break up the boundary layer. So what happens is, you know, the, the leaf transpires and, and you get this like saturated droplet of water on the leaf, right? If, if, um, if there's basically a pocket of air forms around the leaf and, and blowing air across the surface of that leaf, breaks up that pocket of air, allowing that moisture to evaporate that we can then remove with the air. Um, it also discourages some pests. You know, imagine a little gnat trying to fly around in a windy condition, right? Anyone who uh, has had to deal with chiggers or sand flies in Florida or other tropical areas know that on a windy day, there are none of those. On a still day, you get eaten alive, at least I do. Okay, so HVAC, it's all about balancing the gains and losses within your given control volume, aka your growing room environment. Okay, so you have heat gain, that translates into cooling needs. You have heat loss, 
That translates into heating needs. You have moisture gain from evapotranspiration. That's dehumidification, right? So whatever's going in or leaving your grow space is what we need to make up for with HVAC. So why is HVAC so hard? Why is it so difficult to get right? Well, there's a lot of reasons. First off, HVAC equipment is really developed, was really designed to be good at cooling, right? Cooling us, cooling people, cooling machines and data centers, right? It's meant to keep us comfortable within a temperature range. And therefore, it's not really very good, or there's not a lot of equipment out there that's really good at removing moisture. Everyone's put so much energy into cooling and not into moisture removal. Also, engineers and manufacturers, they don't understand plants, and many of them don't understand humidity. In fact, many of them don't understand that psychrometric chart that I showed you. And, you know, and growers, for their part, don't understand energy balance or the limitations that HVAC has. Um, you know, they think that HVAC is, you know, should be as easy as turning the lights on and off, and it's really not. Um, also, dehumidification is incredibly energy intensive, and plants are dynamic living organisms that, quite frankly, you know, they don't have feet. They can't go over and change the thermostat, right, when, when they're uncomfortable, when they're too cold or too hot. So the primary challenges associated with HVA equipment is their operation, their controllability, planning for HVAC, the professionals who are developing and designing HVAC systems, and regulators. Regulation is coming. So HVAC operation. One of the reasons it's so hard to control the operation is because we are dealing with a non-steady state environment, right? Your grow room changes all the time, right? Your plants are growing. They started as little baby seedlings and have grown into, you know, a full canopy within 30 days if you're growing leafy greens or a few months if you're growing tomato plants. The room conditions are constantly changing. Um, you know, you have different temperatures and humidities that you're trying to control for when the lights are on and different ones when the lights are off. Um, same with, you know, and VPD is associated with that. You are turning lights on and you're turning lights off. Some of you are ramping lights on slowly and ramping lights slowly off, creating a sunrise sunset stage. And then, of course, there's irrigation events. Every time you irrigate, we can actually see the blip on the screen when moisture, all of us, you know, a little bit more moisture uh, comes into the room environment. Something I don't have in here is some people spray, right? They have foliar sprays to spray either for pests or to spray with fertilizers. And uh, that injects a lot of moisture into a space. So, this is a graphic. Some of you have seen this. I've presented this before, but um, in Sacramento, our uh, electric company, SMUD, they have been doing some studies on, on cannabis facilities, looking at different ways that growers are growing and different systems that they're using. And we extracted this data from one of their reports. Um, oh, I guess I moved my chart here. So something that you see, this pink line are the lights. And you see this orange line is the rate of condensate that we're collecting from the room, okay? So that's the dehumidification that's happening at the air conditioning system. You see the temperature kicking up, and, and a lot of that has to actually do with that temperature differential between day and night. So they were controlling for a lower temperature than when the lights are off, and then a higher temperature when the lights turn on, but you kind of see this overshoot happen right when the lights first turn on and relative humidity remember that graphic I showed where the opposite temperature and humidity were happening well this is relative humidity relative humidity you can see that dip happen before the air conditioner turns on and then everything sort of stabilizes but what's interesting to me about this graphic is this dynamic transitional environment we are creating every time we turn the lights on and when we turn the lights off so you see it takes, there's this two hour period when you turn the lights on 
that we're able that that we're removing more and more moisture from the air conditioning system. Um, this is a product of probably two things. One, the plants waking up, sucking up the irrigation and or the water that's at their roots, and then transpiring it. But it's also about the operation of the equip, the HVAC equipment itself, and it's not able to pull out you know, the rate of evapotranspiration as quickly as it's being generated by the plants. And then you see the opposite thing happen when we turn the lights off. Look at how long it takes. It takes four hours almost to hit a steady state condensate removal after the lights turned off, even with this sort of, you know, sunset period. Um, and, you know, now all of a sudden there's no lights on. Why would the air conditioner system be on? Right, most of the air conditioners that that people have are designed for temperature control. So as long as you have heat being generated in your space, there's no, you know, then we are by default dehumidifying with the cooling coil. But as soon as there's no more heat generated in that space, the air conditioner is like, hey, I'm happy. You know, it's 70 degrees in here. I don't need to turn on. And now all of a sudden, you lost your capacity to remove moisture. So, you know, the other thing is that HVAC operation doesn't always meet our expectations, right? So, and there's a few reasons for this. One, first thing, if you don't know this already, lighting does not equate to the total cooling that you need. The total cooling load is also not equal to lighting plus transpiration or moisture. In fact, it's something kind of in between in that the total cooling load is equal to the heat generated minus evaporative cooling. The reason plants, when I showed you that psychometric chart, have a slightly lower leaf temperature is because they are evaporative, evaporatively cooling themselves and they are thereby evaporatively cooling the air around them. Um, the other thing is that, you know, dehumidification is really what drives cooling capacity if you have cooling and dehumidification all wrapped into the single piece of equipment. Um, and dehumidification equipment is notoriously undersized. That's why I had humidity control, you know, on my list of primary concerns twice because all of you are dealing with this. All of us are dealing with this. So. Dehumidification is really the ability to remove moisture, the moisture removal capacity of the equipment. And it depends on the type of equipment and it depends on your room conditions. It really depends on your room conditions. Manufacturers report moisture removal capacities at standard rating conditions. Okay, so if you just Google right now, you know, dehumidifier, and you look at four or five different suppliers or manufacturers, you pay attention and you look at their pints per hour, pounds per hour, gallons per hour, moisture removal capacity, and then pay attention. They all say 80 degrees, 60% relative humidity. Now I've seen some other international companies that have different standard rating conditions, but here's what I'll tell you. None of them are the conditions you guys are growing at, right? Vertical farms, you know, I'm typically seeing somewhere between 65 to 72 degrees and a 50 to 60 percent relative humidity as the target. Cannabis, you know, they're looking at say 70 or 75 degrees and 40 or 50 percent relative humidity. So, you know, the <laughs> the piece to take away from this is that the re one of the reasons you are struggling with humidity control is because you are believing what is being printed on a document from these manufacturers at standard conditions. And they have to prove that they can meet those moisture removal capacities. But look at this. This is just one manufacturer. This is the unit's rated capacity in pounds per hour. It's almost 10 pounds per hour, right? Nine and a half pounds per hour, 80 degrees. This purple line is 60%. Vertical farms, like I mentioned, are more in this range, right? So let's just say we were running at 60% and 70 degrees. Our moisture removal capacity is now seven pounds per hour instead of nine and a half pounds per hour. If you are running at 60 degrees, 
or let's say, you know, let's, let's do a different number. Let's say you're at 40% in 70 degrees. We have now reduced our dehumidification capability of that same piece of equipment by two and a half times. That means you need three dehumidifiers, not one, to do the same moisture removal. HVAC equipment is not efficient, um, right? So one reason is a lot of equipment is just on-off control. They're not, it's, we're not including variable speed controls. That's getting better. We have oversized equipment. Uh, we have dehumidification and the association of energy with that. And, and then there's, you know, on top of that compounded, growers are scared of using outside air. And if we don't use outside air when it's perfect outside, um, we are losing potential to cool for free. So, you know, sticking with this whole idea of dehumidification, um, I really want this to be a big takeaway, is that it is insanely energy intensive, no matter which way you try to slice it. So if you do air conditioning or a chilled water system, typically the leaving the temperature leaving that cold surface, those cold coils, is less than 50 degrees. We are designing a system right now that's 36 degrees, almost freezing. We don't wanna deliver that air to the plants, right? I mean, we don't want it to be 36 degrees in the room, so what do we do? We reheat the air before we deliver it to the room. So now we have all this energy intensity for working the air conditioners to a really low temperature, and then we add heat. <laughs> so that we can get a good environment. Energy intensive. Okay, Nadia, let's do desiccant then. Well, that's also not the magic bullet because we also need heating and cooling. So now we're gonna, we need to recharge the desiccant. The desiccant has absorbed or absorbed moisture from the air, you know, with um, basically, I like to call it kitty litter. You can also use liquid desiccant but you have to recharge that desiccant so that it will continue to absorb water. And we do that with hot air. Well, that hot air is frequently greater than 120 degrees. So we have to add heat. Oh, but wait, now we don't want a room that's 120 degrees, so what do we do? We cool it. So no matter which way we slice it, whether we cool it, then heat it, or heat it, then cool it, we are still using a lot of energy to remove moisture. That damn latent heat of vaporization has a lot of energy associated with it. So controls. Look, <laughs> there's a lot. If you are a commercial controls provider or you are a horticultural or agricultural horticultural um, controls provider, this is not yet a married sort of um, system. So we have struggle communicating between the control system and the HVAC system. The user interface is all over the place a lot of times. Sometimes you have to go directly to the HVAC unit to make changes or to see what's going on. Some of them have remote monitoring capabilities but not controls capabilities. You know, if, if, so that the user interface can be a challenge. Sensors. This is one of my favorite photos that I've taken of all time in a cannabis facility. We are literally looking at four different sensors, all reading four different temperatures and relative humidities. The one on the computer screen you guys can't read, but that's what's being read by the HVAC system. And it's a full three degrees less than, you know, the leaf temperature, which is, you know, greater than the room air temperature from this little device, this handheld device, which is you know less than this temperature device that's just strapped to the ceiling, basically, or at the top of the plant canopy. So, I mean, what are which is right, right? Do we take an average of these? Where do we put them? I've had all-out wars, <laughs> battles, I should say, uh, with HVAC providers who don't understand why growers would want temperature and humidity sensors out in the room. They think that it's good enough to just have it in the equipment because that's what the equipment sees, so why do we need to know what's happening in the room? Um, so horticultural systems, you know, tend to be very simple, right? On, off, control, they're all in one. You get irrigation, 
lighting and automation and fans, right? All these things that you can do with a horticultural system. But then I talked to, you know, to these providers and like, what do you mean we have to control an air conditioner? We don't have BACnet. We don't have Modbus. We can't communicate with an HVAC system. So it's like, okay, well, let's go talk to the commercial guys. Well, they have more complex algorithms. They have energy management protocols and, and algorithms that we can implement. They understand HVAC. But then once they get to know the facility, they say, well, what do you mean we have to control irrigation? We don't do that. We don't understand nutrient management. That's foreign to us. So now do we have two different systems or do we teach both of these, right, these vendors, these providers, what we really need? So, you know, one of the things that I come across a lot early in the conceptual design and even during the design when there isn't a well thought out concept um, for the site or for the facility, is that people aren't thinking about installation uh, in their planning uh, needs. So one is, you know, first is utilities. Do you have power? Do you have natural gas? If you come to me and tell me that you have 400 amps of power, but you are going to be building a 10,000 square foot vertical farm, you've got to go get an upgrade um, because we're just not going to be able to find a piece of HVAC equipment that can operate at such a low amperage um, as, and, and, and I'm sure you're eating all that amperage already with your lights as well. Another big one is the physical dimensions of this equipment. This equipment is big. This equipment is heavy. Where do we put it? Do we put it, can your roof support it? Can the ground outside, is there space for it? Or are you right up against the boundary, um, your property boundary? Can we put it inside the room or inside the building? Um, I'm the type of person who would prefer to keep all equipment outside of the space that we're growing in because I don't want to do maintenance or have service or have a condensate leak or change filters or anything inside the room. I want to keep that all outside to keep it as clean as possible. Um, but sometimes when we're not thinking about space, we don't have any other choice. There's also noise. A lot of, I'm finally starting to get people ask me about noise, both interior for your workers and exterior for your neighbors. Maintenance, right? Do, can you access this equipment? Do you have to go up a 30 foot ladder, you know, on the side of the building to access the equipment on the roof? Um, how, how are you going to do that? Have you created enough room to pull those five foot or four foot wide filters out of the system once a month? You know, adjacency to the rooms, you know, how are you moving air to and from the rooms? What are your plans for expansion? And what is your budget? You know, I, I put some, num I just put this number here so that, you know, HVAC equipment is expensive. And I see a lot of people willing to put in half a million dollars for their lighting system, but are then shocked when, you know, their HVAC equipment is more than $30,000. You know, the HVAC equipment for a $500,000 lighting system is probably $250,000. Um, so just having a realistic idea of, of your budget. So I just wanted to give a couple of examples here on space planning. This is a project we did recently and this pink box is the HVAC unit sitting outside. And we looked at two different units, unit A and then unit B in two different configurations. And what I want you to notice is the fence line. So unit A has this fence line. See this wall? This is how we can tell. This fence line is pulled back from this wall. Now we have this other unit rotated in this direction, and we're now encroaching on this wall, right? Now we have to pull that fence all the way over. We rotate, okay, so it's like, okay, well let's rotate unit B the way we had unit A. Well, based on access to this unit, the fence encroaches even further out. So which system do you think we went with? Um, well, actually, there was a second step to this and the client was really concerned about noise. And we were actually able, it turned out that smaller unit that had a smaller fence line also was really quiet. 
And since there's sort of an outdoor dining area nearby this project, um, having a low rumble, you know, that was not more than having a conversation um, was really lucrative. And that's what we went with, you know, so this was a quiet outdoor unit. Now I have measured decibel levels of indoor units that have been 85 decibels or higher. I mean, and people are not wearing ear protection. So, you know, we should be thinking a little bit more about noise, in my opinion, um, for the health and safety of our workers, as well as for being a good neighbor. I had a project in San Francisco, and, you know, the neighbors were concerned about traffic and noise, and they had a legitimate concern because that HVAC equipment is operating 24-7, and there are a lot of residences re uh, around, around this facility. You know, and let's face it, HVAC professionals are not growers, right? I mean, they have a lot of rules of thumb that they've developed over the years with commercial and residential buildings that just don't work for plant environments. So what do they do? They band-aid fix it and they oversize. I have literally heard people say, oh, you just add 20, we just add 20%, 50%, 100%. We saved a project a million dollars because they had oversized their equipment 100% just as a safety factor, because they weren't sure. Um, there's a lot of snake oil and unproven technology um, that's easy to sell to growers because they don't have an HVAC engineer or background to support them and tell them, be careful. Uh, we have a lot of repurposed HVAC equipment that was being used for commercial applications that are trying to be you know, used in plant environments and they don't work, and just a general lack of understanding and one of these pieces of, of snake oil that I want you all to avoid is air filtration and purification technologies. Look, particle filters that have a MERV 11 filter, that have a MERV 11 rating can pull out mold spores. And that's what most growers are concerned about. Forget HEPA, you do not need HEPA. You don't even necessarily need, you know, ozone or ionization. I usually don't even say those words because I don't even want to put them in your head, but we don't need those quote unquote bug zappers as long as we have good particle filters that you're changing frequently. So, you know, the HVAC regulators, regulators are also not farmers and do not understand growing plants in a building. They have lack of understanding and experience. A lot of them have never even been in an indoor farm whether it's cannabis or vertical farm or greenhouse, right? They are trying to apply and want to apply commercial standards to horticulture and agriculture. They're using metrics that we wouldn't dream of using, right? Like energy use intensity. We would use, you know, kilowatt, kilowatts per gram or grams per kilowatt, something that is a productivity-based metric. They don't see that necessarily. And part of that's because we have not, all come together to decide, decide what those metrics are. There are a lot of active groups right now that are trying to tackle some of the issues around HVAC. So um, I'm, I'm involved in some of these, not all of these. Uh, ASABE, American Society for Agricultural and Biological Engineers, is um, developing a co-standard with ASHRAE, which is the HVAC Engineering Society, basically, we're developing a standard uh, HVAC for indoor plant environments. I think a couple of you on this phone call might be um, part of that. Uh, ASHRAE, ASHRAE, the HVAC Engineering Society, they are hot on this industry. We have technical committees. They, we've submitted research proposals that they want to fund. They want to develop standards. They, I mean, every person in that society has touched these facilities in some way. Um, there's a filtration group. The American Fil Association of, of Filters contacted me recently. They want to know how they can serve growers better and these environments better. Um, the Resource Innovation Institute, they are developing, or we're developing an HVAC power score. So depending on what sort of HVAC system you have and the size of your facility, you know, how are you doing in terms of energy? We haven't talked a lot about how we're deciding what that energy use is since most people don't know how to model it or, um, 
or aren't collecting data specific for it, but they're trying to do something. Um, and that's specific to cannabis. The California Public Utilities Commission is vowing to include in the building codes in 2022 a section for horticultural environments. Uh, I'm just starting to get involved in that, but you know we need all of these voices uh, on this call um, as participating in some way or at least tracking it. The state of Massachusetts, um, for cannabis anyway, has put a limit on lighting power density, right, that EUI of 36 watts per square foot, basically mandating LED lighting. Um, and then, you know, a few of us on this call are part of this SCRI research USDA grant um, where we're looking at different variables, environmental variables, and their effect on profitability and productivity. Um, and, and I'm sure there's more. Maybe you all are associated or know of some others. I'd love to hear about them. But regulation is coming. Codes are coming. We're trying to develop standards to get ahead of it. Okay, so key takeaways. How am I doing? Okay, not too bad. Um, look, HVAC is a challenge for a lot of reasons. You know, paramount is that not a lot of people understand it and not a lot of people understand growing environments. They either understand HVAC or they understand plants and usually not both. HVAC really struggles with dynamic and transient conditions, struggles with dehumidification, especially at our grow room conditions. It uses a lot of energy for that dehumidification process. It's hard to control or find the right controls for it. It's expensive. Um, it's big and heavy and noisy, um, you know, those standard, standards and regs are coming. And, you know, the bottom line is that we could do a lot better job as equipment manufacturers and designers and operators if we understood the data better and what was going on and, and what VPD and what temperature and what conditions you can live with which ones boost profitability and, and help you manage risk, and which ones are absolutely a no-go. And that even is the place to start, especially with the regulations coming and saying, no, nope, that is you know, off the table. We can't live with that because we will not um, be able to produce a viable, quality, consistent product. Okay, so that's it. Um, as I mentioned, I can talk about this for hours. I do, I give workshops um, biannually. The next one will be on the West Coast, and it's an all-day workshop. I think some of you have attended that. Um, so look for that in the future if you're interested. Uh, and I guess I'm ready for questions.